by you in this crisis in your life. I said your wife did not stand by you. No. Uh, Dr. Navier, when about seven years ago you were struck off, what were your circumstances? My circumstances were that the only thing I had left in the world at the age of 38 was the house. That's the house in Motcombe Road, which you owned and where you still live? Yes. What means of support did you have? Well, I converted the house into four flats and let off three of them. And uh, the rent from those flats has been your sole income? Yes. Well, now that we've established the manner by which you support yourself and why, we come to the question of your relationship with the present tenant of the, of the basement flat. That's Mrs. Mary Heppel, the last witness. How long have you known her? Eighteen months. And that was since she and her husband first took the flat? Yes, Alan Heppel. They'd only recently been married. How old were they? He was 21 and she was um, 18 at that time. And what was Alan Heppel's occupation? He was a musician, played various wind instruments in a group. Did they take a lease on the flat? No, not a lease, no, only a, a weekly rental, either side to give a month's notice. Was it furnished? Yes. How did Alan Heppel's tenancy continue? Well, after they'd been there about six months, Mary, Mrs. Heppel, came to see me one day. She was in a very distraught state. She told me she hadn't seen Alan for five days. And, uh... She just heard that he'd gone off to London with a friend. Without letting her know? Or but leaving any message? Apparently. But she told me that she didn't think he was coming back, and she asked me if uh, I would let her stay on in the flat on her own, and that she would be responsible for the rent. Hmm. So Mrs. Heppel stayed on at the flat after her husband deserted her? Yes. And now, will you please tell us when and how she set up as an astrologist? using one of the rooms of the flat as an office? Well, it was some months later, after the baby was born, Mrs. Heppel came to see me and she told me that she had, she had had some training in astrology. She felt that she had a flair for it and she wanted to have a try, you see, doing it professionally. So she asked me if I would have any objections to her using the flat as an office. And what was your reaction? Well, not very favorable at first. Why not? Well, I didn't like the idea of people traipsing in and out of the front door of the house. And I didn't think the tenants upstairs would like it very much either. But then we, uh, we had the idea of putting in a separate entrance to the basement flat. Something which I'd often thought of doing. So having thought it over for a week or so, I, I agreed. Was there anything else that persuaded you to agree? Anything else? Well, the question of the rent. Oh, yes. Mrs. Heppel had said that she was prepared to pay a considerably higher rent for using the flat as an office. And what was the new rent to be? Well, we discussed it several times and we decided on uh, a figure of 50 pounds a week. 50 pounds instead of 11 pounds? That's a pretty hefty jump. Yes, it is. But you must take into account the structural alterations to the flat and the cost of redecorating it, which badly needed doing. It hadn't been done for, for years. And, of course, the fact that it was to be for professional use, not just residential. Who picked the figure of 50 pounds? You or Mrs. Heppel? We mutually agreed it. You didn't demand the rent as a condition of allowing the flat to be used for that purpose? Absolutely not. Dr. Neby, am I right in saying that in the ensuing months, Mrs. Heppel has had considerable success in this new venture as an astrologist and has had substantial earnings commensurate with the paying of the increased rent of 50 pounds a week? So I understand. Have you ever at any time in those months had cause to believe that her earnings were from anything other than astrology? No, never. But you were informed to the contrary. When you learned from the police about the allegations against Mrs. Heppel with regard to using the flat for the purposes of prostitution, what did you do? I didn't do anything, my lord. I just couldn't take it seriously. Did you say as much to the officer in charge of the case, Detective Sergeant McCovey? Yes, my lord. Mm. In all the time you've known Mrs. Heppel, have you ever observed anything that might indicate to you that she was working as a prostitute? No. In the year or so since that her husband deserted her, you, you've known her quite well? Yes, quite well. From what you know of her, do you find it conceivable that she is or ever has been a prostitute? Oh, utterly inconceivable. Thank you, Dr. Napier. Dr. Napier, although you were struck off the medical register a number of years ago, you still call yourself doctor, do you? 
I am a doctor. Well, you cannot perform the functions of a doctor. Why continue to use the title? I spent seven years of my life training and qualifying and a further 11 years practicing medicine. What am I, if not a doctor? Well, that's a moot point. Now, you say that since you were struck off the medical register, you've had no other employment. Yes. I take it you're able-bodied and in reasonably good health. Yes. And yet you haven't done a stroke of work in, what, seven years? Well, I've already said that. In leading a life of leisure, have we? Leisure? Having a profession taken away from you, I wouldn't call that a life of leisure. Wouldn't you? You've just been living off the rents from your property, haven't you? I'm... Sounds pretty leisure to me. Call it what you like. I had no choice. No, you would sooner be still practicing medicine, which you have been forbidden to do since November 1967. Now, will you tell the court who delivered Mrs. Heppel's baby a year ago? I'm asking you, who delivered Mary Heppel's baby? I did. Now, will you please explain how it was that you, a doctor who had been struck off, attended this young woman, delivered her baby? It was an emergency. Really? What sort of emergency? It happened unexpectedly. The baby was three weeks premature. It was in the middle of the night, about 4 a.m. I had to act quickly. What were you doing in her flat at 4 a.m.? I wasn't in the flat. She telephoned me. Oh, she telephoned you at 4 a.m. You came running down the stairs, didn't yes, you? Yes, yes, I did. I came running down the stairs. And she told me she was in labor. She felt the baby was going to be born at any minute. And while I was examining her, the waters began to break. Why didn't you at once phone for a doctor? Of course I telephoned for a doctor. By the time I got through to one, the baby's head had appeared. And after that, it only required some encouragement from me and then basic hygiene. It was highly unethical of you not to have waited, was it? Waited. Not? And put the mother and child at risk. The doctor didn't arrive till half an hour after the baby was born. The fact remains that as a doctor who had been struck off, you should not have examined Mrs. Look, Hepburn. any midwife can deliver a baby. Any, any policeman can. What do you think I am? A leper? Good God, man, do you think of someone here in this court today collapsed with a, with a heart attack or a serious injury? Do you think I wouldn't be called on to do what I could? Or do you think that the person whose life was at stake would give a damn while I was struck off the bloody medical council? B, have you ever had any other intimate physical contact with Mary Heppel? No. You've never had sex with her? Mrs. Heppel has already testified here in court. Well, Mrs. Heppel has testified. I'm asking you if anything of a sexual nature has taken place between you. No. Ever kissed her? Kissed her? Well, I've kissed her goodnight a couple of times, if that's what you mean. Have you ever kissed any of your other tenants goodnight? Oh, don't be ridiculous. Well, I'm sorry you think it ridiculous, Doctor, but I must ask you to answer the question. No, I have never kissed any of the other tenants goodnight. Thank you. But then, of course, Mary is... You do call her Mary, do you? Yes. Mary is a very special tenant, isn't she? Not only does she provide you with by far the major part of your income, but she also gives you companionship from time to time. Yes. Now... Now you describe your relationship as being on friendly terms. You've described it as knowing each other quite well. But I'm wondering, Dr. Napier, if there isn't something much deeper between you. Would I be right? No. Are you quite sure? I mean, think how much you have in common. It's really quite remarkable, considering the great difference in your ages. I mean, there's your mutual interest in music. You've encouraged her towards classical music, I believe. Yes, I have. I'm wondering just how much influence you, a man of 45, have exerted over this young woman just 20. I mean, she was certainly at a very vulnerable stage of her life when she was left deserted and pregnant on your doorstep. I have uh, exerted no influence over her. Well, there's something else you have in common, isn't there? Your bitterness. Now, Mrs. Heppel hates men, doesn't she? She spat it out when she was giving evidence. Yes, she's bitter about some things, yes. And you, your bitterness, well, that's had seven years to fester, hasn't it? Bitterness against the woman who you claim gave the false evidence which ruined you, against your wife, and above all, against the law. How you must hate the law. What contempt you must have for it. I do not have contempt for the law. Were the two of you thrown together, drawn to each other by your shared anger at the world, both loners? Well, I've never seen myself as a loner. Haven't you? Have you got many friends, Dr. Neighbor? Do you have much of a social life? I have one or two friends, but most of them have dropped me, yes. A recluse, almost, until this young woman came on the scene and the, your association began. On friendly terms, know each other quite well. No, I suggest there is a strange and powerful bond between you which the court has heard nothing about. You say nothing, Doctor? Dr. Napier, the jury may take your silence as an admission that what learned counsel suggests is true. No, my lord, it, 
it's not true. There is no bond between us. Dr. Napier, not only is there a bond between you, but there has also been a conspiracy between you. A conspiracy to convert the basement flat into what one witness described as a little gold mine. And to use Mary Heppel's attractiveness and complete lack of scruples and morals about sex to produce a fast turnover and fat profits. No. That's to, not... to flout the law by the clever rigmarole of giving astrology reading. You're distorting it all. Well, it not... is only too clear that the main business being conducted in that basement flat was prostitution. That's a lie. I Everything think you've said is a lie. Silent. Mrs. Heppel, if you cannot remain silent, you will be removed from the court at once. The police came to see you, not once, but several times during a six-week period, did they not? Yes. They said that they had reason to believe from their own observations that the basement flat was being used for prostitution. And you said you adamantly refused to believe it. Yes. But didn't you ever, during that six-week period, Doctor, didn't you ever talk to Mrs. Heppel about it? Did you tell her what was being said? Did you ask her if there was any truth in it? Yes, yes, I did. And what did she say? She said that in a way it was true. She said what, Doctor? She said that in a way it was true because she was using her looks to get money out of men. Well, I asked her if she ever took money for sex and she said no, that she didn't. That she didn't need to. That men were... Yes? That men were suckers. Men were suckers? Yes, and that they would pay her the money whether she, they got it or not. And she told me she'd give it all up if I wanted her to, if it was causing too much trouble. So what was your response? I told her, my lord, that if she wasn't in fact taking money for sex, that she wasn't a prostitute. And she had nothing to worry about. Hmm. Or oh, to be more accurate, did you not say, as long as you're careful to tell the suckers that the money is not for intercourse but for the horoscope, get them to sign the receipts, we're in the clear. That is not what I said. Well, we'll leave that to the jury to decide. Now, there's just one more matter I want to speak to you about your personal finances. Now, it's apparent that from 1968 until the latter part of 1973, your rent book shows an income from the three flats of between £24 and £28 a week. Is that correct? Yes. But then suddenly, towards the end of 1973, things took a turn for the better, didn't they? Without any great exertion from yourself, without uh, your having to... Uh, uh, stoop to uh, the indignity of taking a job, your income shot up from £28 a week to £67 a week. Now, that's a big difference, isn't it? I'd say you were doing very nicely, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you, Dr. Napier? Yes. And of that £67 a week, £50 was coming from the earnings of Miss Virgo, your little astrologer in the basement. I have no further questions. I wish to re-examine, Mr. Yes, my lord. Was there ever any plan or plot or conspiracy between you to make money out of prostitution using the trappings of astrology as a protective cover? No, never. Do you believe that any of Mrs. Heppel's earnings have come from prostitution? No. Thank you, Dr. Napier. You may return to the dock. That is the case for the defense, my lord. Mm. Members of the jury, the accused Paul Alexander Napier faces a charge under Section 30 of the Sexual Offences Act, 1956, namely of living wholly or in part on the earnings of a prostitute. Now, I must instruct you in three unusual aspects of this case. Point one, it may not have escaped your attention that a large part of the prosecution's case appeared to be directed against someone other than the defendant. Indeed, there was a time when it appeared that someone else was on trial here and not Dr. Napier. Now, the reason for this is that it is essential for the prosecution to establish that that person in question, namely Mary Heppel, was at the material time a prostitute. If they fail to establish this, then the case against the defendant collapses. Because no matter how much money he had from her, no matter how much influence he may have exercised over her, he is not guilty of the offence with which he is charged. Now, point two, you might well ask yourself then, why was not Mary Heppel's guilt or innocence re-prostitution decided at some earlier trial? The answer is that no charge could be brought against her. Prostitution, per se, was not an offence at law. Only certain fringe activities connected with prostitution are offences. If this appears an anomaly, I'm sorry, that is the law. Point three concerns the burden of proof. Now, it is a cornerstone of our system of justice that the burden of proof lies with the prosecution and that a man is innocent 
until he is proven guilty to a jury's entire satisfaction. There are one or two rare exceptions to this premise. And one of those exceptions concerns the case before you. And I refer you once again to section 30 of the Sexual Offences Act, 1956. A man who lives with or is habitually in the company of a prostitute or who exercises control over a prostitute's movements in a way which shows that he is aiding, abetting, or compelling her prostitution with others, shall be presumed to be knowingly living.